Okay, um, so I think I'll go ahead and get going. So hello everybody, hope everybody's doing okay. <coughs> I've been coughing all day today, but uh, I think it's just kind of an allergy sort of cough. Sometimes get that, hopefully. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm still looking at, um, I, I talked a little bit about the, I might kind of have the first assignment here um, um, using these simulators. So I wanted to give maybe a few assignments. Plus I, I'm also, uh, I mean, it's not too much longer till um, we had scheduled a midterm test. So kind of keep that in mind. So I'm planning on trying to get some uh, practice kinds of questions um, that uh, will be representative of the kind of stuff that you can expect from the uh, comprehensive exam. So I know people always have to kind of keep that in mind for these uh, core courses. So, um, so anyway, the, the, the bigger tests will probably be kind of a mix of basically the same kind of um, questions that you get on these quizzes, the same test bank sort of questions, but I'll probably also give you some questions that are really the, similar same kind of things that you that we've been usually using for the comprehensive exam for the computer architecture so a mix of those basically so. uh, all right yeah so kind of as usual i'm probably gonna you know go till about eight or eight ten and take a break um and then do some more um i i mean I think there could be a lot to talk about tonight, so we'll see. Um, but, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, because, yeah, besides this, I also wanted to look a little bit at the cash simulator uh, that I might make an assignment with and a few other things. So, all right. So, kind of looking ahead. Um, so, so we're talking about cache memory, but, but you know, all, all this week and the next couple, two or so, we're really kind of fleshing out some of the details of different component, different important components of a modern general purpose computing system, right? So, uh, I mean, we'll be looking even at more um, at memory and memory technology next week. Um, and then kind of going to um, external memory. So distant thing, we'll talk a little bit about the memory hierarchy today. So yeah, to me, um, uh, maybe this chapter really should have been called, you know, memory, the memory hierarchy and cache memory. So the, the first part is really more of, yeah, computer memory overview, to, which is really an introduction for all three of these, um, kind of next, this, sec this chapter and the next two. Um, Okay, so to start off with, um, probably the most important thing you should understand about a computing system is um, that there are all kinds of different memory components. So the, our textbook claims that that uh, you know different types of memory systems are the uh, maybe the most varied and and the um, most different kinds of those. I mean, I, I don't know if that's true because, you know, IO devices are certainly lots of different kinds and very varied as well. But, um, um, but, but definitely in both cases, you know, there, there's, there's a, lo a, a large variety of them. For IO, there's a large variety of devices because there's large, there's many different ways that you might want to get data in and out of the system, right? For memory, um, and for in memory, we include both internal and external. We'll talk a little bit about that. Or you should have read a little bit about that um, distinction. Um, but you know, memory on a computing system is is there to hold data for processing, basically. So whatever the the, the memory device you're using in the so-called memory hierarchy, um, I mean, it's mostly just the basic operation. You need to uh, read stuff from it or write stuff to it. Right, and and I guess I/O devices are similar, but but it's it's a little bit more uniform um, the, the way that I view it anyway um, uh, uh, across the memory hierarchy like this. So, um, okay, so 
the, the, the reason why, I mean, if there was one perfect memory technology, we wouldn't have this kludge of all these things together. Um, you know, so if there's one memory technology that was at the same time cheap, fast, and you had, you know, was sufficiently large enough to hold everything you need to hold, uh, we would just use that. But unfortunately, there's nothing that meets all those criteria. So um, the memory hierarchy in a modern computing system evolved because we need a system that is simultaneously, that, that, that has memory, that can store data, uh, so we can read and write it for processing, uh, that is simultaneously cheap, fast, and large, um, but, but um, since we don't have one technology that can do all that, we have to uh, put a couple together uh, in order to achieve, uh, you know, a bit of a, com it's a compromise, of course, but to, to achieve, get close to those goals on, on all those areas, um, we use different things, right? Um, and, and that's what the, the hi memory hierarchy is, okay? Um, Um, I guess another thing to keep in mind, um, so we talked about this in previous chapters, but uh, always keep in mind also that both for IO devices and memory devices, they are, um, you know, so, so even, even when we say fast here, um, they're, they're still orders of magnitude, even kind of the, the fastest caches that are closest to the processor. Uh, they're, they're much slower typically than the processor. So that gives a bottleneck. Um, so in particular, you know, the, what, what we think of as main memory um, or, or RAM in the memory hierarchy. I mean, that, that's the thing that uh, we mostly use, may, thus the name, main memory. That, that's the one that we, that, that is the most um, for, you know, our, our typical processing to, to hold the stuff to that, that we want to work with and calculate with and to hold the programs as well that we're executing uh, but because you know the the technology we use for main memory is so much slower than the processor um, we've ended up with you know so it started off with just one cache in between in order to try and um, reduce the performance bottlenecks the the, the memory bottleneck that we have um, and, you know, if you've read this chapter, you know, you, that, that um, modern general purpose computing systems will have, you know, two or three. I mean, most of them have three. The, the Intel architectures all have level one, level two, and level three of cache in between the registers on the processor and your main memory technology, your RAM. So, um, So yeah, I don't, I, I don't know how to, how much detail to go into all these things. You know, this is just all, it's a good kind of summary, all the things to keep in mind. Um, location, internal versus external. Um, so, I mean, this, this designation is a little bit fuzzy, I, I would say, but yeah, I mean, most people would, would make the, the distinction that internal uh, stops at main memory. So, and, and um, the way technologies work right now, that, that is really um, the volatile types of memory. So looking ahead to um, the physical characteristics, right? So, so everything that registers cache um, and RAM are volatile, right? So th they only remember the stuff in them as long as they have electricity. If the power goes off, you know, poof, that all goes away, right? Um, and that's kind of, that's, that's a limitation, but that's, um, you know, to have cheap, so starting with RAM, to have uh, a cheap memory system um, that's at least relatively fast, you know, so, so RAM is much faster typically than the external. So another of that dividing line between in, internal and external, um, is, you know, it happens at volatile, non-volatile, and, and the, the non-volatile stuff is, is you know, was kind of hard drives. Now we have solid state drives, um, which are kind of getting into the gap between there. I'll we'll talk a little bit about those, right? 
Um, but uh, I mean, typically, you know, the your external devices were again much much slower than RAM, right? So, so every time you go from one of these levels, I mean, you should be thinking like an order of magnitude or two in terms of difference, so ten or a hundred times slower. And and actually, you know, it, it would be a good idea. I should probably. Uh, probably find some examples of that, you know, so it's good to actually have some real numbers to see kind of what your, your access time or your, uh, would be for each of these levels on like a modern computing system. To, so, um, so anyway, that, that's kind of internal versus external. So uh, I guess another thing though is, is that really, so, external uh, like like drives or solid state uh, devices um, you know your hard drives uh, which we think of as external memory but you know I mean those are kind of IO devices so so yeah I mean the the integrated circuit um, works a little bit differently and, and caches in terms of sort of the interface that you think of of how you read and write um, so in particular you often think of it more as just reading and writing one byte or one word of information at a time for all the stuff up to that um, internal boundary. And then, you know, drives, they are a type of memory device for permanent storage, uh, but um, because of their slowness, I mean, they are, they're never kind of read just one byte at a time. You know, you're always going to be um, transferring at least one block um, and if you can you try and set it up so you can transfer many blocks um, in one kind of operation to, for efficiency so. um, okay so I probably kind of toughed on a lot of these now to going back down to the list here so capacity is important you know so I mean you know what is large enough of course is a moving target also so what was large enough 10 years ago um, is small by, by today's standard. So, so not only have processing speeds uh, been increasing exponentially, but so, so as the power of the computers increases exponentially, that means that we can have a corresponding ability to work with bigger amounts of data um, and, um, and do other things. So, um, that implies that our needs for data, at least the, the size or capacity, also increases at a similar kind of exponential rate. So, um, you know, transfer. So, like I was, I was kind of saying, I mean, you you normally transfer internal thing, or you normally think of those as reading and writing single bytes or single words for like your uh, main disk and cache, although. Uh, as we're going to talk a lot about today, really, whenever you're transferring stuff into cache, you are transferring stuff um, more, you know, more than one byte or more than one word at a time. You're, you're transferring a block or a, a cache line uh, at a time. So, so you do do a little bit of that even on the internal side of this external internal divide. Um, yeah. And I hope it doesn't, I mean, there's some fuzziness to some of these. So, so you know, kind of word, especially. So everybody, if you say a byte nowadays, probably means eight bits, okay? And a bit, of course, is just a single zero or one. So, so those are certainly concrete. A word is a little bit fuzzier. So, I mean, you used to have systems that uh, might have, um, um, so, so sometimes a word kind of really means a byte, like the, the natural, um, size of kind of a unit of information. Other times a word is more um, associated with like the um, uh, the address size or the, 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 the bit size of your machine, like a 32-bit or, or a 64-bit architecture. So some people might use word to, rep to mean like 64 bits in a 64-bit architecture because it's natural to transfer 64 bits at a time. Um, and it's, it's natural then to use 64-bit um, um, data types, like like a 64-bit float or a 64-bit integer for a lot of your processing and, and having instructions that work on 64-bit operands. So, um, but even, even that, whether you're talking about 32-bit, 64-bit architecture or whether a word means a byte or whether a word means more like the natural unit of organization, um, 
again, it used to be a little bit more varied, but you know, the addressable unit really has standardized down to a byte, you know, so system, systems that where, you know, one address in memory uh, holds one byte or eight bits. Um, systems that don't do that are, are kind of pretty strange. And, and, and I don't know of any of them in terms of the general purpose computers that we use, your laptops, desktop servers, um, and even phones and things. I mean, they're all going to be using memory that's um, uh, the addressable unit is one byte. So. Uh, yeah, so I talked a little bit about kind of 32-bit and 64-bit. So those are important things to know about your architecture. Um, you know, specifically, they, um, oops, I got a little problem in my, got to fix that there. So they, um, um, they are related to the number of bits that you can use for, naturally, for memory addresses. And, and actually, 32-bits, if, if you work that out, uh, and that, that's 2 to 32, I got a couple of problems there. Um, that's really only four uh, billion or four gigabytes, right? So uh, in effect for a 32-bit machine, um, it's really unnatural to be able to have a computing system with more than um, four gigabytes of memory. But as you probably know, I mean, lots of systems, even, I mean, certainly servers and things, but even your own personal system might have more than that nowadays, at least your laptop or something of main memory. Um, so, and I won't get it, I mean, it used to be, actually there were workarounds so that you could use more than eight gigabit because, you know, back, you know, I mean, this wasn't that long ago, you know, just a couple of years ago when 32-bit was the more common for the operating system and the architecture, uh, I mean, you still had servers that had 64 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, 128 gigabytes, you know, uh, even with the 32-bit operating system. So there, there are ways to, to, to extend the things, even though the architecture, um, but, but even though the architecture was kind of limited to 32 bits, but um, um, they were a bit kludgy. So 64 bits is a lot bigger. And um, um, since I messed it up there, I'm gonna I'm not gonna be able to remember. I'd have to recalculate it myself. But um, um, it's um, uh, quite a bit larger. <laughs> so more than typical on, on servers uh, that you would find, even in the largest servers with the largest amount of uh, main memory being used in supercomputers and things. So. Um, access method. So, um, although, you know, I, I kind of assume that everybody, when we understand that all the internal memory is basically going to be random access for the most part. Um, Although we'll talk a little bit about cache memories, which have some properties of being more like associative memories um, a little bit here. So, you know, random means to first approximation in this case that the, the time to access any word or byte of data at one memory location is going to be equal to the time at any other location. So if I need the byte um, at memory address zero, that takes the same amount of time as to, to transfer the byte at the very last memory address in my main memory, right? So that, that's random access, right? It's, it's, it's constant time, O1, to, to read or write from anywhere in the addressable memory space. But um, things externally tend not to work like that. They, 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 they're more sequential or kind of um, uh, a combination, okay? So sequential, uh, Pure sequential would be something like a tape drive, if, if you know, if you've ever seen one of those. And, and they're still used for backup purposes in some places um, because they're very cheap. But, um, you know, if, if I want to read or write something that's on the end of my tape, I have to, you know, I have to put in my, put the tape into the drive and I have to wind it all the way to the end of that. So I got to wind it past, sequentially past all the data on the tape before that to get to the spot to read or write. Um, so um, rotating disks like um, you know, magnetic disks or um, optical um, uh, laser disk DVD things, um, it's 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 both sequential and random. So so right, you know the, the you know the medium rotates right. Um, so 
if I'm and and you segment along the 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 platter onto tracks, uh, which are basically rings around, right? So to get to a track, I have to move a physical head. So that's kind of a sequential operation. So I first have to do a sequential operation to move out, you know, out to the edge for the, the track at the edge or into the, to the middle of the rotating medium for the, the track at the insiders or somewhere in between. And then once you've positioned on the track, you have to wait for the medium to the, 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 the platter to rotate to get to the location that you want to read or write. But um, uh, so 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 it's kind of in between, right? So I mean, I don't have to sequence go sequentially through everything. You know, I just do one bit of movement to get to the track I need, and then I have to wait for the rotation to come around to the right place to do the read or write for the particular block that I want to get. So. Um, all right, we'll talk about associative caching here a little bit later on. So think of, if, if you know what, um, um, like a map, like, like uh, in, in data structures in computer science, what um, a dictionary or a map is, um, it's kind of a similar idea when you're talking about associative memory, so. Um, So, is there anything else we should talk about here? Um, I think we talked about all these. So, volatile versus non-volatile. Um, again, you know, an ideal memory would be would be um, you know uh, fast, uh, cheap, and and large, and would also be non-volatile, so that we didn't have to worry about when the power goes off um, that we have to reload stuff from our um, non-volatile. Um, memory. So, well, I kind of skipped over like you know solid state drives. I mean, everybody's probably aware of those. I mean, they are no longer. I mean, they're being used uh, in the memory hierarchy in the same place where disks um, and optical drives are used. So as external storage, but they are built from semiconductor technology. So so they are not um, physical devices with with mechanical parts. So they they're more like RAM. Right, but they are non-volatile, so you know, um, um, so they um, don't. You don't need to have the power with them um, all the time um, in order for them to remember the stuff. So you can turn it off and turn it back on, and, and it remembers like a uh, a permanent storage non-volatile disk, right? Um, and they are, you know, again, the, I, I'm not. I don't know exactly why. I mean, they are um, semiconductor technology. Uh, but they don't perform quite as well as RAM. So, so you know, I mean, if, if someday that technology, so you could have both the non-volatile but was performing as well or better than volatile RAM technology, um, you know, we'd probably end up um, um, using, you know, so, so then all of a sudden you'd have the stuff that we think of as, as hard drive and external um, would, would become um, like solid state drive um, and, and kind of fu fuzzy the boundary between external versus uh, internal there. So um, anyway, so but solid state drives today, I mean, they, they are better performers than uh, the fastest, usually than the fastest um, magnetic um, media. So, so they, so for very high performance needs, they make very good replacements for um, hard drives in a system. but they cost more. So if you have the money, right? Um, there are some other things I kind of skipped over. So, I mean, and you'll see these. So there's, um, uh, there are things that are like RAM, but are non-volatile. Um, so often we put in your bootloaders and things that need to be hard coded into um, your general purpose computer to, to start things up initially into ROM. Um, or slightly more, there, there are these other technology you might have heard of, like EEPROM, um, erasable, programmable, read-only memory. Um, so read-only memory, once you, once you um, program it, um, I mean, it's there forever. You can't really do anything. But you can have other things that you can, uh, with some effort, that you can actually write in like a new um, 
um, update onto it. So, so you can erase it, um, but um, it's not easy to do that with EEPROMs, but those can be used in some systems. Um, so, so again, I mean, the reason for all this and for the hierarchy um, is an engineering kludge. So we want things to be fast, uh, uh, cheap, and have a large amount of it, but we don't have one technology that will provide that for us. So by using different types of technologies, um, we can get kind of the performance that we need. So this, um, you know, so as you go down kind of this pyramid that, that they used uh, to illustrate the memory hierarchy here, um, I mean, you should understand these first three. Um, I mean, it makes certain that you do. So, so it should be obvious that, that um, well, well, maybe not obvious, but um, um, let's start with the easiest one. It should be obvious that capacity increases, right? So, so you, you only have a few registers, and, it, and, and then you'll, you'll have caches will be pro progressively bigger and bigger. Uh, maybe memory, you know, so caches will be like uh, kilobytes to maybe a megabyte or two. Um, uh, main memory of that will be a couple gigabytes, and then you'll have terabytes down here at your magnetic disks, um, and then you know you might have offline storage to hold um, petabytes of stuff that you've pulled down from you know your uh, um, astronomy telescope or something like that, right? Big data projects. So, so capacity gets bigger as you go down and down and down. Um, but it, it, the, these get slower and slower, so there's increasing access time as you go down here. So, so your your registers are the fastest. They're almost you know they're, they're they can operate at the same clock speed as the processor. They they are right there with the processor. Um, but there's only a few of these. You know maybe uh, five, ten, maybe, maybe a couple hundred um, in in a complex instruction set where some of those are general purpose, but most of those are um, um, not general purpose, they're specific for one thing or another. So, um, and then cache will be a bit slower, and each level of cache, level one, two, and three, uh, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but is slower and slower and slower in terms of access time. Although, again, all of this cache is often actually on the CPU, you know, on, on the processor um, integrated circuit nowadays. So. Um, and then main memories is in the gigabyte range in current computers, um, and, and it's slower th still than cache, and then so on, right? So I think those two. So decreasing cost for a bit. So the reason, um, again, is that um, you can have like large amounts of storage on your magnetic disks or your solid state drives nowadays. Um, um, and, and, and the devices are relatively cheap. Right, so that comes out to that uh, it's a very small cost per bit of storage here. So the problem is that it gets more expensive. These, these technologies that can perform at or closer to the processor speed uh, increases the cost. So if I want to have the same amount of main memory as I do using that technology as I do of magnetic disk storage, I could get it. So I could I could have you know. Um, um, Uh, you know, uh, 100 gigabytes or uh, 1,000 gigabytes of main memory, uh, but, it'll, but it'll cost a lot. Be too expensive. It push the price of your system up beyond like a typical server or a typical uh, personal computer uh, that, that a user would want to afford, right? So, so anyway, so um, so these are more expensive per bit as you get closer and closer to the the processor and they get less and less expensive. Um, so they, they would have to be a lot less expensive or else you wouldn't be able to afford to store, you know, the, the big data, the huge amounts of data that you need for offline storage and things like that, right? Um, and that brings us to this idea of the locality of reference, I believe, um, which was this part D here. So <coughs> So this is a very important thing to understand. It's kind of a fundamental concept. This is, this is what makes this engineering kludge of the memory hierarchy possible at all. Because 
um, there's a decreasing frequency of access uh, needed um, as you go down this hierarchy, which means that, um, that or, or we can set it up so that we're gonna need a decreasing frequency of access as we go down the hierarchy, meaning we need to access these things uh, in cache much more frequently than we need to access the things uh, down in permanent storage on external or down in offline storage, right? Um, so the, the reason why this all works is, and, and, and the basis for that you can set things up for this D to be true, is because of a property of computing uh, and, and programs, the way that we write them and execute them, known as the locality of reference, right? Um, which in its simplest form means memory references tend to cluster, okay? Um, so if, if, I hope if everybody thinks about that, even, even just for a small amount of time, this should also seem obvious to you. So, so think about typically how you um, organize uh, a program, right? You organize a program that you're writing, uh, the, the, the default execution is sequential. So that means however you organize it in memory, uh, if you're organizing the instructions in memory, um, you're usually gonna have the first instruction you wanna execute um, at the first location in memory, um, and then the next in instruction at the next uh, location in memory, um, and so on, so, so on as, you know, if you're doing sequential op, um, execution, right? And that's the basic part of the fetch execute cycle that we talked about um, in the previous chapter. Um, of course, you know, it's not completely uh, serial. I mean, you, in order for your programs to be useful, you have to be able to do some jumps, so call some procedure calls, uh, do some loops and things, right? but a large part of the execution um, is sequential. And that implies that if I need to access memory location 300 to fetch my next instruction, I'm very likely to need the next one after that uh, for the very next CPU cycle and, and, and so on, right, from that argument. So it should be obvious that um, um, in terms of executing instruction, and remember, I mean, the instructions have to be put in memory. So this is one of the ideas of our stored program computer, the von Neumann architecture. So both instructions and data are in memory um, uh, for all these hierarchies. So we store both data and compiled or um, interpreted programs on disk, in main memory, and in cache um, as we're executing them, right? Um, But in, in, in locality reference, you know, again, if you think about it for data, um, also holds as well, um, usually. Maybe, you know, our textbook, I think, maybe touches on this somewhere a bit in here. So, I mean, the, the, the property of the amount of locality or the property of the correlation between two instructions can be a little bit different, the characteristic of if it's, if it's instructions versus data, um, so, but, but, but it still holds pretty strongly for data as well, maybe a little bit less so than for instructions where, you know, the sequential execution is, is a, you know, the, the, the basic and very common. But, you know, for data, again, we often organize it in like, like an array, for example, and, and there, you know, the first bit of data is gonna be in location zero of your array and the next bit, bit of data that you might wanna process. So as long as you're processing the data by index in your array from zero, one, two, so on, you'll be access, accessing that data mostly sequentially to read it and, and write it back you know, in and out of that array. Um, but even for things like, you know, um, objects or uh, database tables or things like that, you know, again, it, it still tends to be pretty highly clustered. Um, um, if you need, like, if I need to read a record from a database, um, um, I'm going to be using multiple bits of information in that record, and, and th that data in that record are going to be stored close together on, you know, wherever, on the hard drive or in main memory, so. All right, so, you know, and, and I mean, I, I would hope everybody could intuitively understand why that's true. And, and, and you know, and it's pretty easy to, to show both empirically and through simulation that, 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 that 
that holds strongly as well. So, so it's been shown many times that um, um, that works. And if it didn't, you know, we wouldn't be able to have uh, a memory hierarchy like this. So, um, so yeah, if it didn't hold, it would be much harder, if not impossible, to engineer a memory hierarchy. So, so why is that important? Because basically the way like, like the two level cache works here that I think, yeah, we talk about kind of right now at this point in our textbook. Um, so if we have a memory reference, um, think, of a, think of a basic two level cache. So let's say instead of, let's say we just have one level of cache um, in between our processor and main memory, all right? So that's our two levels, cache and, uh, and main memory. Um, and, and then typically a cache is going to be at least an order of magnitude or, or maybe faster than main memory, but it'll be much smaller. So typically what happens is since this cache is very fast, um, we first will check and see if we have a reference to a piece of data or the next instruction we want to execute. We'll first check and see, is it in cache? And if it is, great, it's a hit. It's called a, a cache hit. Um, and we can just transfer it, transfer it at the fast cache speed. Uh, into the register or into the instruction register if it's an instruction we want to execute or into a general purpose register if it's a piece of data that we want to perform a calculation on, right? But if it's a miss, um, then we don't have any choice, but you know we need that data or that next instruction to execute. So we're gonna have to go to the slower memory and, and transfer it there instead. But what we do, if, if we do have a miss on a piece of data, um, we find that piece of data that we need in our slow memory, the, the level two um, of our two level memory system here. But we, we also transfer not just that single piece of data um, into the processor to be used, but we, we transfer the uh, block of data. So basically the a block of data around that memory um, reference that we just um, uh, had a miss on, that we had to go to the slower memory to find here, and by and so what happened? And we we transfer that uh, a block at a time into cache whenever a miss happens. So why do we do that? Because it's very likely, because of the principle of locality, that if we needed something that 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 was a miss from the slow memory, we're gonna very soon need things close to it. Like the next instruction after that, we're gonna need immediately after we execute this instruction or the next piece of data in the array that's after that we're going to need immediately because we're likely processing array uh, sequentially through um, indexes right so for, for one miss and, and of course you know it takes the slower amount of time to, to transfer that from the slow memory to the fast memory but um, then we're likely to have many references after that that all be or all end up being hits on in that block that we transferred from the slow memory to the fast memory, right? And as long as you've got good locality and as long as you can maintain so that the hit ratio is relatively high, so typically you need hit ratios to be maintained around 90% or above. If you can maintain that level of hit ratio, uh, you can show what, what the performance is going to be of your two-speed memory here. That's, that's what this figure is, and I want to make certain everybody understands, right? So this is a theoretical um, two-level memory. Um, so to kind of explain this here, I don't think this textbook had this as quite an equation form, but um, really uh, to, to, to find out what the um, average um, or the expected um, transfer rate is going to be so so the 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 average access time um, t here is is really just a um, a weighted average of the time um, for your slower memory which is t2 and the time of your faster memory which is t1 okay so here t1 represents um, the time for the the, the faster um, level of memory cache so let's say that that's like 10 milliseconds, all right? Um, and T2 represents the, the access time to transfer a data or a block of data from the slow memory. Um, so let's say that's one order of magnitude different, so like 100, or uh, actually maybe I should just use the example they have here. So they're using um, T1 of 
of one hundredth of a microsecond and T2 as a tenth of a microsecond. Right. So, um, and, and this represents the hit ratio, the fraction of axis involving only level one, right? So if your hit ratio is zero, what happens? I mean, that means that every time I have to go to um, the slower memory to, to transfer it, okay? And typically what happens, the reason why this is T1 plus T2, so if this is zero, I mean, this term would go away and it would just be, you know, one minus zero. So it, it, the, the access time would be T1 plus T2 uh, because what happens on lots of these kinds of caching systems is you first have to check if there's a hit or not in the level one. So that, that takes T1 amount of time to determine whether it's a hit or a miss. And if it's a miss, then I have to initiate a transfer um, from level two. So that's the, the T2 time, the level two transfer time. So it's, it's the sum of those. And basically when you transfer up, um, you transfer the block up, to memory at the same time, you transfer the, the one word that you really were trying to read um, to the, the ultimate destination, like the, the, the processor uh, in this case, right? Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So, so yeah, if, if you're always having to go to level two memory, um, um, it's, it's T1 plus T2, right? And then the other end, you know, you should see, so if you have a hit a ratio of 100%, that means everything that you ask for ends up being your cache. So, so I can I can satisfy every request from the cache. So that means every that means on average it's just gonna take T1 because that's the, the access time for the faster level one memory, time one there. Right? So and, and you can work that out with real numbers using uh, this formula. So so like uh, and then you know it, and it's really this is really just a weighted average, right? So if 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 I have a 95% hit ratio, that means 95% of the time, H is the hit ratio, 95% of the time, um, I only need T1, time one, the fast time, to, to transfer a piece of data. But 5% of the time, so one minus 0.95 or 0.05, I need to, to transfer it from the slower memory. And if you add that up, so you see that like in this case, you get a 0 0.015 microseconds. And remember, again, the, the um, um, the performance of the, the cache of the faster memory is 0 0.01, right? So that's uh, at 95% hit ratio with one order of magnitude difference. It only takes slightly, it only takes 50% longer on average. This is the average access time overall, even though sometimes it's really slow because sometimes I have misses, but lots of times it's fast. If I can maintain that 95% um, uh, or the 0.95 the hit ratio, right? So and that's the that's the um, the whole of it there for for um, kind of thumbnailing the uh, the performance that you would expect and, and and you should see you know again your your goal is by having this memory clue with two levels of, of memory as long as I've got good locality and I can keep my hit ratio relatively high I can get performance pretty close to the fast memory but still have the capacity of the slower memory right. So, so I'm able to get some of the, the size of the slower memory with the speed of the faster memory um, with this kind of caching scheme. Um, okay, hopefully that kind of all makes sense. And and you should realize, of course, you can you can easily extend this to you know three four levels, um, and as I'm sure I discussed in my notes later on, so, so if, if you count out the number of levels in, in a current modern system, if, if you count registers as, as the first level of memory, there's often three levels of cache, so that's four total, and then main memory um, is a fifth one. Uh, and then we use external storage as usually kind of the, the final one. So, so there's really about six levels of, of memory um, and, and you could calculate this, you know, among all six levels, what your average access time would be. Um, but you'd have to know what your hit ratios are but for each one of these um, uh, levels of your cache um, and uh, combine those as a weighted average correctly. But, um, but it does extend directly to that idea. Um,
Okay, so yeah, that's, you know, um, I think everything I can think of. So hopefully, you know, I mean, there are some important things on there to, to really understand how modern computers work. You know, you really have to understand this little kind of reference. Uh, you have to have a kind of a good idea of, of how caching works um, and why it, can, it works as a um, engineering solution to um, get good performance and uh, at, at reasonable costs um, in modern computing systems like this. So. Um, and that we're, we're transferring a block. So, so we, we were, the, the, the way we take advantage of locality in caching is by, if we do have a miss, we assume we're going to need the stuff around that was close to that thing that we need immediately right now. So, so we want to transfer um, um, more than one thing from the slower memory to the faster memory um, to take advantage of locality there. So. <coughs> Um, yeah, so I think, um, let's see here. Uh, so, I mean, I've, I've kind of probably talked ahead on, on um, most all these things. And there's the their same diagram of the kind of generic two level memory hierarchy here. Um, So, and yeah, I already talked about, you know, this is the, just the, in general, the algorithm of how a caching system works, you know, so you first always have to check if it's a hit or not. Um, if it is, you're good, just deliver it. Um, so you get, at, you get it at the very fast speed. If it's a miss, then you do a couple things, um, uh, including transferring the, a block of memory around the item. Um, and also then delivering that word that was originally needed to the to the um, original requester. Um, so and yeah, we already mentioned that uh, typically in modern systems there's three levels of cache. It's even more complicated than that. I don't know if I get a chance to talk about it, but often like for example, um, I know I talk about it. Our textbook talks a little bit about it down here. That um, um, often we will split our level one into a cache specifically for instructions and a cache specifically for data because there's slightly different locality characteristics of those two different things. It's very easy to tell if you're fetching something to be instruction because that's in the fetch part of the cycle. So anytime you have a memory reference for the next instruction to fetch for the program counter, um, you can get that block down into the instruction cache, right? Um, and, and it's important for pipelining and stuff to have um, uh, a separate instruction cache that really helps with a lot of the logic, my understanding, with, with a lot of the logic for doing like the pipelining and the out of order um, um, execution and some other stuff. So. And then, you know, if you're, if you're fetching something which is part of an operand for an instruction, you know that that's really a piece of data that's going to be operated on. So you, you throw that into the uh, um, data cache of your L1 kind of split here. So, um, yeah, and, and in general, so, so, so cache consists of a number of lines. So that's just kind of the, the, the typical nomenclature, I guess, you know, so, so some number of lines that C um, in this diagram here, uh, where, it's, it's lying because it holds a block of information, uh, a block of data, a block of bytes, basically, and then some kind of a tag that we can use. I mean, basically, this has to be something that's like an address so that I can check for, for the piece of data that I'm trying to, to, to access. Um, I can use that to see if it's a hit or a miss by using the tag here, uh, which will definitively tell me, do I currently have that block that I need loaded or not? So, so a block then is, is some number of words. Again, these are all parameters that can be set. And, and um, for, for different levels of cache, I mean, there's another table down here, but for different levels, you know, so for your, um, for your L3 layer uh, of cache, you'll want to have bigger block sizes uh, and larger numbers of lines. Um, and then these smaller caches will use smaller block sizes, you know. So you might use like a, like a kilobyte as a block up here at level three. Um, and you might use something like even like 16 bytes or, or 32 bytes as a block size down here at level one cache. Um, 
so yeah, if, if so, whatever your um, whatever your definition is of your block size and the number of lines, um, you know, so what, whatever the, the block size is, is kind of a fundamental thing. So whatever the block size is of your cache, that divides memory up into chunks, basically, and those are the units that when you have a miss, get transferred uh, into, you know, what we what we call a line here um, in our um, faster level of memory here. Um, so yeah, a couple things before um, uh, this is, um, we're going to look at a little bit of this, some of these things in more detail here in a bit. Um, so one thing to understand that I that I I skipped over here um, is that you know, I mean, you do understand that that your your faster memory um, is is smaller than the slower memory. So so there's a lot less um, amount of storage in the cache, right? Just because it's more expensive. So so we can't afford to have a lot of it. If, if it wasn't more expensive. We would just make everything of the same technology as the cache and, and not have to have this memory hierarchy clued, right? But since it's smaller, that implies, uh, and, and um, typically it, it's much, much smaller. So the number of lines, you know, the, the number of blocks that we could store is going to be much, much smaller than the total number of blocks that are in the, the faster memory, memory, no matter which level of cache that we're uh, working at here, right? So that implies that um, I've, I've got a problem because um, the, the typical steady state of cache is that all of these lines are full. So usually very quickly when you start running a program, um, uh, you get a lot of misses initially, you fill up all of your cache, and then at that point you're in trouble because now I reference something um, and I have a miss. But everything, um, my cache is filled up with some, with stuff. Okay, so um, once you get to that state, and like I said, I mean that's the normal state that happens real quickly uh, that you fill up your cache. Then you have to start making what are known as replacement decisions, right? So um, if I do have a miss, I got to select one of these lines to to kick out to remove, so I can read in the block that I just had a miss on um, into that freed up line. Right, and that's an important decision of, of selecting which one of these to kick out. Um, that we'll talk about a little bit, I think. Um, I mean, you know, the, another consideration. Um, is uh, when you are selecting a block to be kicked out. I mean, some of these blocks could be have, have data in them. So it could be that, that, that as you've been executing a program, you've been writing new information. But if that information has only been written to the cache, it's not out into main, you know, it, it, out here kind of permanently. So if I select something to be kicked out, I can't just, you know, throw it away. I mean, if there are changes, those changes have to get reflected back up to the slower memory. So they have to be written back out, right? So you have to have other things besides your tag, you have to have other control bits. Um, so at a minimum, you need like a dirty bit is what it's often called or a modify bit. Um, so that as soon as one thing gets changed in here, that modify bit goes from zero to one. So then you can use that as part of your replacement decision that, okay, if I, if I select something to be replaced, this dirty, um, I, know I, I first have to write it back out before I can then do the transfer to read the block in. Um, to that uh, to that line that I just selected for replacement. So. Um, okay, and then, I mean you know a lot of the stuff we've I've, I've already kind of described. You know the the um, the, gener the generic sort of transition diagram of, um, of um, 
algorithm of, of how caching works. You know, so that's all the things we've been describing here. You know, your, your first thing is whether it's a hit or a miss, and then you have to worry about um, um, uh, replacement. Um, and um, I'm just noticing, I don't know if it, it has in here for the algorithm for you know checking if you have to write stuff back, if you have a dirty line that you select for replacement. Um, all right. Um, okay, that's a that's a good place to stop. Or well, I, I'm gonna take a break. I mean, not stop, but uh, take a little break here. Um, so I got to regain my voice a little bit. Um, I still have a lot more I'd kind of like to talk about, but I'm gonna have to go a bit faster. But while we go, let's see, it's almost eight twenty, so maybe eight twenty-five here, um, and then we'll come back and kind of finish up with this. And I kind of want to show. A little bit of some of these ideas with the caching simulator as well. So, all right. So, I'm going to pause here. Okay. Let's start back up again. Hopefully, everybody had a chance to take a little break. Um, okay, so I'd like to, yeah, this might not take quite as much time as I was thinking, but I would like to, I've got a little bit to say about all these maybe. Um, so, so yeah, uh, probably later on we'll talk a bit about virtual memory. Um, so it's important concept uh, used by operating systems. So, so all operating systems are based on uh, virtual memory paging systems, uh, at least all general purpose kinds of operating systems. Um, and there needs to be support for that at the, in the computer architecture. Um, so at, at the, the hardware level, you've got um, support for virtual memory through so-called memory management units. Um, and that um, gives a, a bit of a um, um, choice or a problem for cache um, because I mean, basically all addresses are logical um, in terms of how they're stored and referenced, uh, but you have to go through a translation process to, to go from the logical into the actual physical address, right? So that gives you kind of a design choice. I, can, I could put my cache where I'm caching based on logical addresses before MMU trans or I could put the cache um, after, um, uh, you know, and only be caching uh, um, um, on the physical addresses, right? Um, so because the, 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 the memory management unit, it takes time to do that translation, um, uh, doing caching on the, the logical addresses can be uh, advantageous because you can, you can ex skip all of that translation for anything that ends up being a cache hit. But um, there's a big um, kind of monkey wrench in that, in that virtual addresses are specific to the concept of a process. So, uh, so if you do try to do this, I mean, you have to ha you have to know both what the logical address is, but also which particular process it is within that logical address space, the, the virtual address space um, uh, that's requesting that. So that means that, that your, um, your, your tag has to be a combination of the virtual address and some identifier of the process. And remember that all has to be done in hardware. So that's kind of um, getting pretty complex there. So. So although, yeah, so this is something, uh, I mean, I guess apparently like a simple idea is that every time you switch a process, um, uh, one thing you can do instead of trying to, to, to do that is just flush out your caches if you're using a logical cache. Um, but of course, you, know, you can see that would be pretty inefficient. So that every time you do a process switch, you would, you would throw out everything of, of in the cache that that process was using, so that would all have to get reloaded in. So, so it's not clear whether that would actually um, be efficient or not. So, um, 
I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about memory management and virtual memory um, later on. Um, we'll have to talk a little bit about that in the next chapter when we talk about memory technology, um, most likely, I believe. So. Um, Cache size is, of course, an important property. So both the, the block size and the total size of the cache. Um, I really should probably, we really should ought to extend this table. So, so uh, we, my version um, 10 of the book only goes up through an example through 2011. So I don't know if, I'm not going to look it up, but I don't know if they have a, a bit more information on the version 11, edition 11 of the textbook. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, notice that, um, you know, we, we're, we've evolved over the past um, uh, 30, 40 years uh, from one level of cache. So, so we began introducing uh, two level caches um, in the 90s to the 2000s. And then, yeah, probably, um, I wouldn't have guessed maybe quite that early, but probably, you know, since 2000 and mid 2000s to later 2000 the later knots, um, it began to be uh, pretty um, standard at three levels of cache, right? And one thing that's not indicated here is whether this is internal or external. Um, so. um, oh, another thing, maybe I'll just point out real quickly on this, and you can see kind of the, the relative size. So as of like nine years ago, you know, we're, we're around kilobytes of total cache size at the smallest one. Remember, gigabytes, you know, we typically have on like a workstation server, we're going to have you know, 64 gigabytes, maybe 128 gigabytes for, for bigger servers. So we got um, uh, kilobytes, megabytes at level two, and, um, you know, one megabyte and then tens of megabytes at the level three to, um, to cache uh, gigabytes of main memory um, out here, right? Uh, I guess there's a level four on the IBM uh, mainframe server there. That's interesting. Uh, oh, another thing to point out. Um, so notice um, whenever you get a split here, that's the um, the split between um, instruction and data caches. So I assume it's probably instruction slash data, and usually they're equal. Although notice, um, and um, I'm not certain about this. We'll talk about the six by 32 probably means that uh, is indicating this is what's known as the set associative cache here for the core i7, Intel core i7 chip. Um, so I, I would have guessed that maybe you'd want the uh, set associative for the data, but uh, maybe I'm wrong on that. So, so, so maybe that, that is right. So, um, so yeah, we're saying that there's actually six I mean, you can think of it as six separate sets of 32 kil kilobyte um, caches for the instruction uh, cache when we do instruction data split here on the level one cache. So. Um, all right. But yeah, I mean, there are some big trade-offs, but um, I mean, these have mo these numbers have evolved. I mean, they're, they're tracking, of course, the increases in typical of main memory size that we need. So that means that you really need kind of bigger caches. Um, and um, and yeah, so, so, so you know, as, as main memory continues to grow increasingly larger, the, these will have to get bigger to keep up the same sorts of performance and get around the memory bottleneck. So, um, okay, so here's what I'm, I'm going to spend probably most of the rest, uh, hopefully I can fit into 30, 30 or 40 minutes here, uh, talking about the mapping function and look at maybe just real quickly some um, uh, actual kind of simulations of some cache here. So. The mapping function um, we've already touched on. I mean, it's a requirement because there's much fewer cache lines, much fewer storage in the cache than there is in the, the um, higher level memory that the cache is caching. And, and that's true for all levels, right? So, so your, your uh, smaller, your, your, your faster level is going to be smaller than the, the slower level that is caching. Um, 
that has more of it, right? So that implies that we have to have a, ma a mapping function. So we have to have some way, um, if we bring something in, uh, to figure out which line, you know, uh, of, of our limited lines that uh, we want to load it into. So there's three basic mapping functions, direct associative and set associative. Um, and then the other thing that we'll talk about, um, you also have to worry about replacement uh, for some of these. Um, so so if, if cache is full, I have to make a decision of, of something to kick out. It's known as a replacement decision or a replacement algorithm. So, um, so direct mapping is the simplest. Um, and um, let me see if I can explain it real quickly. Um, oh yeah, so, so the way to read this, this figure here is, is um, for direct mapping, each block in memory, if it's going to be cache, if it has to be loaded into cache, will go to a specific designated line. Okay, so let's say, let's put just some concrete numbers on these here. Um, maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, so here we're saying that we have M lines. So let's say, I mean, you know, um, um, uh, we're not even specifying. I mean, I, I think some of our examples specify what the actual block size is, but you can think you can kind of ignore the block size. Block size is just however many bytes is in a line that gets transferred each time you need to transfer something from 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 memory um, into the cache or or back, right? Um, so, so this is supposed to be, this is a little bit backwards, it's supposed to be main memory over here. So if I have, let's say, let's say I have 10 cache lines, right? So basically then uh, if I need to pull in the first block of memory, that we normally index those start at zero. So the block zero of memory, um, and again, this is supposed to represent a whole block. So, you know, whatever the block size is. Um, so if I need to pull in that block, it always gets mapped to line zero. If I need to pull in block one, the next block in memory, is, since I'm dividing memory up into blocks of all of equal size, block one would always go to line one. And again, like, like if M is 10, then block number nine, since, since we're indexing starting at zero, would always go to line number nine. Right? So what happens if I need to load block 10? The, the one after um, this. Well, block 10, you, you do modulus, that's, that's the, the formula up here. So, so you just do 10 uh, modulo 10, which gives a zero remainder. So block 10, if it needs to be loaded, would get loaded to line zero, block 11 to line one, and so on. That, that's what direct mapping is, right? So every block, however, whatever your block size is in main memory, if it needs to be loaded, it know, you know what line it's going to go into, okay? So that means that you actually don't have a replacement decision for direct mapping because you know which one it has to um, replace. You know, if I want block 10 to be loaded, it has to replace line zero. If I want block 20 to be replaced in my 10 line example here, it has to replace line zero if there's already something in that line, right? So, I mean, has, that has lots of advantages. It's very simple. I mean, there's really no replacement decision. It's inexpensive, easy to implement um, you know, on an integrated circuit. So, um, I believe lots of things either use, but, but um, it, it's, well, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm guessing lots of things, lots of caches still just use direct mapping because it tends not to, so, so you'll get some advantages in performance using associative or set associative, but, um, um, it doesn't, doesn't often give a lot of advantages to outweigh the simplicity, okay? The, the disadvantage is this, though. So thrashing can be possible. Um, thrashing is a technical term, which means in this case, uh, this occurs, uh, a, 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 a simple example. So let's say I'm running a program that has a piece, an instruction that happens to be in 
block zero of main memory and has a piece of data that instruction is working on in a loop over and over in block 10. So to fetch the instruction, I end up having to load um, block zero to line zero, um, and then I do my fetch. But then to fetch the piece of data to operate that instruction operates on, I have to throw out line zero immediately and load block 10. Right? And if, if that's in kind of a tight loop, then I go back and redo the instruction again, but then I have to go back and load block zero. So at that, at, at that point, I'm just keep loading block zero and block 10 uh, over each other over and over again to line zero. And what that means is I'm, I'm, I'm never getting a hit. I'm never being able to use my cache. It's, it's always missing in, in that extreme situation. And, that, and that's what thrashing is. That, that's basically, in this case, thrashing is um, um, uh, we are always having to go to the slower memory um, to perform the memory reference access here. So there's various mitigating strategies. Um, the textbook just mentions a victim cache, which is really pretty similar to the um, set associative cache here. In fact, I'm not certain that there, there, there's really a functional difference on those. Um, so, so the basic idea here is that for a victim cache, um, we might keep uh, like more than one line, um, or, or well, keep more than one block for each cache line, okay? So in that case, let, let's say you have two. So in the scenario I was just giving, um, instead of one line zero, I have two line zeros. And I can put, um, in that case, I can put my block zero of memory into one of those lines for line zero, and I can put the block 10 into the other line for the line zero. And then I avoid it, I avoid the thrashing in that case, because I've got two that can hold my my zero line or ten or line right, but you know um, I mean no matter how many of those kinds of victim lines you have, um, I mean it's always a possibility. So so now I, I don't thrash if I just need two, but if I then if I also need um, block twenty, um, I, I I could be back to thrashing right. So if I need twenty, I've only got two. If I've already got zero and ten in there. I got to kick one of those out, but then I might need to to get the one that I just kicked out immediately and um, so on. Right? So that's the main disadvantage. Um, oh, yeah. So <coughs> associative mapping um, is kind of on the other extreme. So basically, and I'll try to explain it relatively. I mean, there, there's a lot of details in here. Um, um, hopefully, uh, for those interested that want to, to get dig into it more, um, there's some good examples that you can dig into here if you're reading our textbook. Um, but the basic idea of associative mapping is that the mechanism we want to have a mechanism that allows any block of memory to to go to any one of these lines. So we don't want to hard code it. So if you need a particular block, it always has to go to that line. So so if you go to the other extreme, anytime you need a block, it could potentially be put into any of these lines. Okay. So this can pretty much eliminate thrashing um, for the most part, um, or the potential for thrashing. Um, but it's much more complex. It's similar to a hashing scheme. So, so think about, so to determine, for the, the very first thing you have to be able to determine is whether you have a hit or not, a hit or a miss, okay? So to, to, to determine if I have a hit, um, I mean, the, 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 the most naive approach is I just have to search every one of these, like do a sequential search um, and either find it if I have a hit which on average I'd have to search through half of the cache to find that, or I'd have to search through the whole cache if, if it's gonna be a miss before I determine it's not there. So of course you can't really do that. You can't really do a sequential search. Um, so usually what happens is you have to have a complicated scheme um, so you can turn that into a parallel search. Um, so, so it's really or O1. So basically you have to in parallel take the, 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 the tag for the block that you want to search for um, and in parallel search every tag for every line in your cache and come up with one answer, whether it was a hit, in which case 
and, and there's an indication of which line it is that you had a hit from, so I can just transfer directly from that fast, um, from my fast memory, or um, there's a miss, right? So, so you can do that, but it's, it's uh, that that's that increases the expense of implementing your hit and miss determination um, uh, quite a bit. Uh, so you have to have a lot of parallelism to do all of that determine to do all of that search in parallel on every line uh, to to match whether your the the reference tag that you need is there or not, right? Um, also, unfortunately, um, it adds complexity to the replacement decision. So, so I might have skipped over it, but but you know the replacement decision is. I mean, there really isn't a, a replacement decision for direct mapping. You know, if I if I need block ten, it maps to line zero. So um, if there's something there, it gets kicked out and replaced. So I know it's going to be replaced for each one of these blocks. Here, uh, if I have a miss. Um, I want to select a line carefully to kick out because uh, the, the, the line that you kick out can greatly affect your locality, which in turn would um, greatly affect your hit and miss ratio. Okay, So if you pick a line to kick out that on the very next instruction or the very next memory reference is needed again, um, you're just going to end up having an immediate miss and having to bring it back in and kick out something else, right? But if you can instead pick out a line that's not going to be needed for a long time, um, then, you know, that's good if, if you can somehow figure that out. And, and there's, there's algorithms, so, so that's part of the um, replacement um, algorithm that um, um, uh, we'll talk about oh in, in just a second here so um, but yeah that, that's associative mapping um, so a set associative is meant to be kind of a compromise between the two um, and really my understanding of it, it it's pretty much like what I described for the victim cache so basically the idea um, um, so um, so the cache consists of a number of sets. Actually, you can do it two different ways. So you can have a number of sets, uh, each with a number of lines, or you can have a number of lines, each with like an associative set. Um, and um, I probably won't go, I won't try and uh, tease out kind of the, the differences between those two ways of doing that. But um, So the simplest, though, is like we talked about for the victim case. So, so you still have kind of a direct mapping, but you have multiple um, um, sets associated with a mapping. So in that case, you know, if I have two sets, I can, I can really have two blocks that map to the same line um, uh, handle those simultaneously, right? Um, So that, that what I was just describing there is really kind of V separated associated ca associative caches. So, I mean, if I do have like two sets um, for line zero, um, I do have to do an associative mapping. So you have to do the things we talked about for the associative mapping among those two sets. So if I, do, if I have a reference to a tag that I know has to go into that line zero, I have to simultaneously check is the, the tag in the first set or the second set. Right, or if I have four um, associative uh, sets, I'd have to do a parallel four. But but that's usually much less than a full associative set, where I have, you know, uh, lots of lines, hundreds or thousands of lines in a typical cache, right? Depending on block size and cache size. So. Um, or you could have uh, case separate direct mapped caches. So, um, so hopefully I'm not confusing those uh, in in my description of them. So, uh, in both ways, those kind of a, in both in, in either case, it is a combination. So, um, you've got to have multiple sets like this. You have to do a little bit of like the stuff we talked about associative, but some of it is direct mapped, right? Um, 
but by by keeping down the amount of of lines that you need to do for the show so you, have, you, you can keep that expense of having to do your hit um, determination um, relatively um, the, the keep the cost down so, um, and, and 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 it can also um, simplify the replacement as well so for example if I only have two associative sets for a uh, direct line, I can just keep a single, what's known as a use bit, right? Uh, and then I can implement like a least recently used, kind of skipping ahead here. So if I, if I um, make a reference to the first set, I would set its use bit to one and the other bit to zero. And then if I make uh, a reference, end up doing a reference to the other set, set it use bit one and the other use bit to zero. And then I can tell by that use bit in, in, in just my two associative sets, which one was most, you know, the one that has the, the use bit set to one was the one that was used more recently. So the least recently used would be the other one. So that, that's a kind of a cheap uh, use bit. So. Um, So um, I just began touching a little bit on the replacement algorithms. Um, so especially for associative caches, I mean, the, having a good replacement algorithm is going to be critical. Our, our book mentions a couple. Um, least recently used is usually the best performer, but it can sometimes um, be a little bit expensive to implement. So at its most general, um, and again, you know, because it's complicated to implement, you know, uh, since all this stuff, we're talking about stuff that needs to be done at the, the circuit level in hardware, you know, that, that, that adds a lot of circuitry and complexity to the chip design, right? So at least recently used, kind of as I've been describing for having just two or a single use bit, uh, you need to be able to somehow determine which um, item in your associative set that I'm, I'm trying to select among for replacement, which one was used um, least recently, you know, it hasn't been used the lo in the longest amount of time. The reason why this works is because if something hasn't been used in a long time, that means it's, it's probably not in currently in the working set. So if something hasn't been used for a long time, it's not likely to be needed again immediately uh, for a while. Right. So it's a good candidate to kick out um, because I, I don't really need any, I probably don't need any stuff on that line or that block for a while. Right? Um, and in simulations, least recently used is, 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 used is the best performer usually is for a general replacement algorithm. Right. But it can be costly. So, you know, um, um, one approach is just to use like a full timestamp. Um, so I could use, uh, instead of a single use bit, I could use um, like say eight bits. And that would allow me to get kind of a, a timestamp um, 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 uh, that has 256 discrete levels, but that might not be enough. Um, so I might need more bits for like a timestamp. Or another approach is to keep um, a list of items. Um, I think the textbook describes this approach. So again, you'd have to have this all implemented in hardware, but if you keep a list, every time you reference an item, you move it to the, to the front of the list. And that implies that you might have to, to, to shift things around on your list or however you're maintaining that list uh, in hardware. Um, and then if you have to make a replacement decision, whatever's at the bot at the end of the list, um, you know, since it never got referenced, it not, never got moved back to the front. Uh, so it, it was the one least recently used. So you would select it for a replacement. Um, most things bec because of, of um, performance issues would either use FIFO or use some sort of a reduced least recently used by like using just like two or four use bits to keep kind of a rough time stamp um, and, then, and then trying to select a, among the ones that have the, the, the oldest time stamp, right? So, um, FIFO is just real simple. So in that, you would treat your cache as just a circular buffer. So my, my first miss goes at, at line zero, the second one at line one, so on, until I filled up. 
And then once I filled up all my lines, I'd go back um, and my next replacement goes back and replaces line zero. So that would roughly give you um, correspondence to usage. But again, you know, um, I could have, line zero could be being used a lot. So it might've had really recent references. So even though I've wrapped around and, and I select it for being kicked out, it might still be used heavily. So that might be a bad replacement system. So uh, FIFO can, can certainly be a much worse performer than least recently used. Um, least frequently used is kind of similar to least recently used. Um, so I'm, I'm keep, instead of keeping track of the time, um, how long it's been since I've used something, I keep track of a rough count of the frequency, how many times a reference has been made to that block um, as a proxy for um, um, how often. And again, you know, things being used frequently probably have also been used recently. Um, um, and, and things that um, haven't been used frequently as other things um, are probably better candidates to kick out. So. Um, so kind of to summarize that real quickly, if you have associative caches, I mean, the, the, the um, replacement algorithm becomes critical, especially for a fully associative. So you probably don't want to use just first in, first out because of it's, it's not a very good performer. So you have to use some sort of least recently used or a modified um, version of least recently used somehow. But if you're set associative, um, you typically have, you know, only two or four or eight um, items in your associative set. So that means that I can use um, a much simpler, I, I would still have to implement some sort of replacement, um, but uh, you know, eight, having eight, um, um, for example, having two, like we said, you only need one use bit. If I have four items in my associative set, uh, two bits should be enough because that allows me to have um, um, uh, timestamps with four levels and everything has to have been used within the last uh, four levels or not, so, um, and, and kind of so on. So. Um, all right, so that was my kind of my understanding. Um, there, there's some more details, examples that, that you should um, uh, um, kind of look through here to, to better understand um, these different uh, approaches. Um, All right, to just wrap this up, um, and then I kind of want to look at maybe a little bit of this caching simulation. Um, so we had mentioned write a little bit. So, so uh, thinking about um, writes to your cache um, adds in quite a bit of complexity. So it's not only just the, the need to, uh, it, when you're doing replacement, to, to write that back. And there's different ways you can deal with that. So you could just always implement a write through, for example. So that, that has the, the um, advantage of being simple, but uh, it eliminates half the advantage of the cache. So write through means uh, every time I need to do a write, I just immediately write it, not only the cache, but I write it up to the, the next level, to the, to the slower memory, so write it through. Right? So in that case though, I'm always having, every time for all the writes, um, I'm always having to do the slow access time. So I don't get any, any advantage of caching for my writes, only for my reads, um, if you're doing that. So the, the more normal approach is to keep a dirty bit. Um, and then, you know, if I'm doing replacement, um, um, check whether I need to write back or not. There's a whole nother can of worms, though, um, for multi-core systems known as the cache coherency problem. Lots of research is done on cache coherency issues. So, so um, you know, in a nutshell, um, often, if we go back to... Um, um, Actually, I have to go back to a previous chapter, but, but if I go back to um, uh, this here. So in a multi-core system, um, I, uh, maybe I forgot to mention, but like if I have a four-core uh, uh, um, uh, integrated circuit, often uh, you might share the level three cache, but you'll have a private level one cache. So each one of the cores will have its own level one cache and maybe even some private level two cache. Although I think it's more um, typical just to have um, 
private level one cash and then to share the level two and level three. So, but if you have any cash that's private, that means that um, if, if two CPUs are working with the same uh, block in memory, and if one of those CPU makes a write, I mean, the, the other one um, um, is not gonna have that update uh, in its cache of, of the modified, and, and that could cause it to function incor incorrectly, right? Um, um, because that, if those two, I mean, those might represent two threads that are running to cooperate on a problem, um, and that other thread is, definitely needs to know it, it immediately um, if that value and that block of memory change, right? And, and that brings up the cache componentry problem. So again, this all has to be done in hardware, but um, um, it, you have to ensure that it's not possible if, if CPUs are using the same ultimately the same block out here from main memory that um, um, if one is making a right change that the other one doesn't get that if it needs to use that. And there, there are different ways um, um, of doing, uh, of maintaining cache coherency. So, so I can do things like bus sniffing or bus watching. So, so part of the hardware looks and sees if there's a reference is being made so it can, it can keep track of whether particular addresses are in multiple multiple of these private caches or not um, uh, to implement right through if it needs to um, um, if you've got copies in private caches um, all right so um, So I think we've mostly touched on all these. So, I mean, you know, these are all design decisions. So the number of caches has been, number of cache levels has been increasing. So typically we have one, two, and three. Um, and yeah, we already talked about the unified versus split. So it's often common to, to split, especially the level, the, the very lowest level cache into uh, special caches for data instruction. So this especially happens for, um, especially useful for pipelining and some other um, issues. Um, all right. So let's see if we can make um, this a little bit more concrete. So there was um, some um, um, pointer to some uh, simulations. I'm going to show you kind of one of these. If you haven't seen, I mean, our textbook has a website. Um, I, I kind of added a link over here on additional materials. We should probably add some more things in here. If anybody has useful stuff or interesting stuff they think for computer architecture, uh, send me a link so I can put them up here. Um, but yeah, our textbook has a general kind of page. It's, it has really separate ones for each of the editions. Um, although for me, kind of, um, Disappointingly, like for example, we're on chapter four. It didn't have the links for these these simulations. Um, uh, you had to go all the way back to um, um, the eighth edition to find these. But anyway, um, um, all those those simulations probably haven't changed much. Um, but uh, I had a separate link for those. Um, so the ones that are talked about um, in our chapter. Um, four here, even on the 10th and 11th edition, this cache simulator, the victim simulator, you can find links to all those. Um, I want to show this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm thinking about having maybe a little assignment using this, this one here. Um, you can use this to uh, simulate um, all the three kinds of caching that we talked about, so direct or associative or set associative. Um, let me show real quickly how that works. So, um, uh, to, to simulate uh, a direct, you'd want to use it, let's use a smaller one so I can make it real quick. Uh, you want to use it with just a single set. So if I have um, just a single set with, with a cache size of four, that, that implies that like four separate cache lines, uh, that's going to simulate like a, a direct um, mapping here, right? Um, and I'll show you why. So let's say here, what, what you're supposed to give is a, um, a sequence of memory references, okay? So, and this should be, you should think of these as like the tag, right? So, so I, 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 refer, I have a reference to some piece of data that 
you can just use um, integers or decimal or, or hexadecimal if you want to. So you can just use decimal or hexadecimal. But think of this just as I've, I've got a reference to some piece of data on block zero, whatever the block size is in my simulation, right? Um, so if you show cache, um, so oh, I've got this backwards. So if I want to do a direct cache, I mean, you can kind of tell. Um, so yeah, if you use four, it's going to be thinking of it as a fully associative. So I want to do it the other way around. I wanted to have um, like four with um, four cents. So, so what that kind of means is um, if you think of it as a cache I have a four with four sets, um, um, that ends up being the same as like a direct mapping. So it means that every one of my um, uh, tags is going to directly map to one of these lines, right? So if I reference um, something in block zero, uh, again, you think of that, that is the tag um, that maps directly to set zero. Um, and if I reference something in block one, two, and three of memory, so this represents a sequence of references. So I needed something from block zero, then something from block one, then something from block two, and then something from block three. So that will fill up um, the memory here, so you do the show cache. And this is supposed to represent a sequence uh, of, of the trace of these references. So, so in this case, these were all compulsory misses because initially the, the um, um, cache was empty, right? So the, the, the compulsory misses only happen when you initially are loading up cache, okay? But um, let's say, So for a cache of size four, um, um, that means, and, and uh, I'm sorry, for a direct mapped cache uh, with four lines here, blocks zero, one, or zero, one, two, and three of memory map to line zero, one, two, and three, right? Block four then maps to line zero again, right? So if I keep having a reference to zero and four, um, this will be the thrashing that I talked about. So, and, and yeah, it calculates the miss rate and the hit rates for you, for your simulation. So if we do that, what happens? So notice, I mean, lines one, two, and three for our direct map remain empty. Um, and we just ended up, we, we had a compulsory miss initially when the cache is empty. Then we reference four with direct mapping is, is, is mapping to line zero. Um, so that caused a, a um, conflict miss. So there was a, um, so for a direct mapping, you can only have conflict uh, misses um, because the, the thing that I wanted, which, you know, which was tag four or block four, wasn't in memory at that point. So I had to, to kick out the tag zero and load in four, okay? And then, you know, it keeps going back and forth. So I keep keep kicking out the one that's in there because both of these are being direct mapped to the same thing. So I end up with thrashing, I end up with a zero hit rate. I never actually use my cache. I'm always having to go to the slower memory, right? Uh, but of course you wouldn't normally have like a pathological thing like that. So if I have like zero, one, two, and three, um, um, they would go in there. So then, then, you know, I might be using things on zero, one, um, Zero three zero two zero three. You know, so those will all be hits after we get our compulsory misses out of the way and get cash loaded up, right? All right, so we end up with a seventy-five percent hit rate um, on there if you include the compulsory misses. Um, so um, at the beginning, so four misses out of. Uh, 16 or 12 hits. Um, so so every, uh, hopefully everybody understands how to calculate the miss and the hit ratio. So miss rate is just uh, the number of misses out of the total queries, four out of 16, and hit rate is the number of hits, 12 in this case, um, out of um, the number of total queries. Okay. Um, but yeah, so you, know, you can simulate these by hand. So then if I had like a four, and a five, those are going to be some misses that have to replace some of the lines, but then I might um, be referring to four and some of the things that are still in there, like um, three um, 
and um, two, and then I might replace back um, the the four with the zero again. Remember, you know, four and zero are direct mapping to the same line zero, and five and one are direct mapping to the line, same line one. So in the simulation, it kind of so notice, I mean, the, 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 the definition of the nomenclature is a little bit different than what our textbook, but, you know, that's, that's normal. So in different contexts, you might get slightly different, um, but, but that's, that's how to get kind of a direct mapping um, here. So as we did that, you know, we had hits all the way until I introduced four and five. So those had to come in here and kick out the line zero one. And then I had um, four, three, huh? I wonder why it doesn't seem like it did all the did all the it only did the four five the four three oh limit okay, so I guess there's a limit to the length there so there we go that went all the way to the end so yeah so four five and then we we kind of use that as our working set for a bit. Uh, referencing you know, all these after that, four, three, two, three, two, or all in there, hits four, five, until we get zero, and that kicks out four again and puts zero back in there. Okay. Um, so that's an example of, of direct mapping and kind of how it works, right? Um, so at the other end, we can do associative mapping. Um, so yeah, that was if, if you just set the set size of one. Um, it thinks of this as associative mapping. So let's see what that means. So here you, we're thinking of this as everything can map to uh, any set or, or in our textbook. Uh, now you have to think of these as lines. So this is line zero, one, two, three, but anything can end up in a particular line. And by, by default, you can set the um, replacement policy, right? So, so, so we'll use least recently used here. So, so yeah, we didn't really have a replacement policy when we're using direct, but here the replacement policy will come in, All right? So now if I reference zero, one, two, three, um, that will fill up our cache. So now um, if I have a reference to something, actually let, let's do a few more hits here. So let's do one, two, zero, two, one, three, two, one, okay? So now the, the most recently used was one and zero was least, was used the least recently back in the past. Okay, so it's been a while since I used zero um, if we have references up to that point. But these have all been hits after that, driving us up to 66% uh, hit ratio, two thirds hit ratio. Okay. Um, so now if I need to make a replacement decision, so if I, a new page is finally referenced, so whatever I just executed uh, needs a piece of data on page four. Um, block four of memory that we don't have yet. So now we're gonna make a replacement decision. So if, if everything's working right, it should decide to kick out zero and replace it with four since that was least recently used. All right, so it did that. Right. Let's have another, so what? So you should be able to guess now. So if now, uh, if we have another new reference, um, we gotta kick, we don't, five is a miss, another miss here. So which one gets kicked out here? Anyone want to guess? You can type it in if you want. I guess I've lost everybody. I don't know if everybody's following me here. So, well, it would be the least recently used, but I can't. I don't have. I have the zoomed in on the screen, so I can't see the whole screen. Can't see, okay, so um, yeah, somebody uh, Isaac got it, so he said three. So yeah, looking back here, yeah, sorry if, if you guys can't see the screen, um, but um, at this point we had a miss five. So going back in time, four, one, two, three, we see you know we've got we've got four, one, two, and three in, are in memory right now, and and three was the one used furthest back in time. So that should be the one that gets kicked out. Uh, when we do that, right? So, so five replaced the three, right? So then we might have some hits for five, two, five, four, and then maybe we go back to zero, okay? So at this point, um, um, this is gonna be another miss, um, and we've used four, five, and two pretty recently, and we haven't used one in a while, so it should kick out one 
um, and pulling the three there for this least recently used okay so that's least recently used um oh yeah they, they don't show least frequently used they do show random so random would certainly be an easy replacement policy but it definitely probably has worse performance even than fifo where you have to be lucky to get good performance. so that's the idea of just pick something at random and kick it out so so, so you have a i don't know um, um you probably don't have a good chance of picking something good, at least not consistently. So, at least with FIFO that you have some information. So, so FIFO is just like round, round robin, right? So um, if I have zero, one, two, three, and we're using FIFO, um, and then one, three, two, one, zero are all hits. Um, but um, if I have a new reference, I have to kick something out. So, so uh, by FIFO, you know, we had loaded zero, one, two, three. So now we, we wrap back around. If you think of this as a circular buffer, and we're going to kick out um, line zero um, here for the replacement. And, and even if I have some more hits, two, one, four, two, one, 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 one. So even if one's been used a lot, um, um, it's going to get kicked out at the very next miss even though maybe that's a really bad decision. So, um, all right, so yeah, that's um, kind of an example of the fully associative. And then, you know, we can do something real quickly with a, um, show an example of a, a set associative, so a combination. So let's do that. Um, so this is two-way set associative. So basically what's going to happen is you think of this as we have two direct mappings, so two direct lines, zero, one, and each one of them hold an associative set. So zero, uh, zero, two, four, six, eight should always get mapped to line zero. And, and then the, the odd, all the evens get mapped to, all, all the even tags get mapped to, to line zero and all the odd tags to the line one here. Um, I think I'm right. Let's see if that's right. So, right. So now if I have, um, and, and here again, you know, the, um, uh, the replacement policy um, should be in effect. So like, um, um, well, let this show, so here, uh, zero, one, two, three. So now if I need another one that directly maps to the line zero, like a four, um, um, it should do at least recently used among just these in its set for that line, right? So it should kick out zero if I'm if I'm doing the the, the thing right, right? Um, and then just to prove that, so um, if if it is least recently used, uh, if we use four a lot, and then I have a, a new one, or let's go back to zero. So so now we've referenced zero. So, so again, we need to kick something out from this set on line zero. Um, so the, the possibilities are four and two, but we use four recently, so it should select two to kick out and, and kick that one out. So there, yeah. Um, and then, you know, we might have some, some some things kicking out of line one. So if we have a reference to five, that should kick out. Let's, uh, so again, we recently used, so if we use one a bit, then we kick out five, it should decide that three from this uh, line uh, associative set um, should be kicked out. All right, so yeah, so, so that's um, hopefully useful for you to understand kind of those three um, different, really two differences and then kind of a, a combination. So a bit of one and a bit of the other when you talk about set associative. So. All right, yeah, so I think that's probably enough for tonight. Uh, anybody kind of wanted to ask a question about anything or have any things to discuss? I was just going to point out the simulation to get to the simulation from the student resource page, uh -huh. the one you just had up. Right, the, the, um, the, main, the main page. Right? It, yeah, if you go to any of the newer ones, it's the world that's turning. It's not labeled. You just have to go to the 
that globe that turns on the screen. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that, that, I, okay. And, okay, I understand that. Yeah, thanks for that. So, yeah, because they use that symbol in the book. So, so um, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's the way that you're supposed to get to those. Oh, there, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's what I was expecting, that, that I would have those specifically with the, the chapters that mentions them in my um, edition of my textbook. So, yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, it's not intuitive, and so... Um, I just thought I'd mention it's not, I mean, since you got both links up there, it really doesn't matter, but um, in case somebody's in there, they could easily go there. So, but, um, sorry, my internet has been bouncing around too tonight for some reason, so um, I turned my video off. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So yeah, as usual, I mean, don't forget the quiz. Uh, like I said, I'm probably just gonna give you some, uh, an assignment. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to be assignments to be a waste of time. And, and I think this is useful. Um, I mean, cache is a very kind of important architectural sort of thing to understand. If you really have to get down into, so, um, you know, um, uh, worrying about the performance of implementations of things on computing systems. So uh, I, I'm most familiar with this because I, I am, a little bit of work in scientific computing and high performance computing and and uh, yeah it's kind of I mentioned in my notes um, um, it's you get very surprising and non-intuitive results because of caching behavior right so just small changes in your threads and how they access memory and things can either completely enhance or completely destroy your your hit ratio on your caches and 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 yeah if you start um, destroying you know if you start losing your your hit ratio your cat your performance goes down and and you know your your performance on your calculations overall plummets so so it's a, it's a big thing to be able to understand caching behavior and 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 the other problem is that that it'll vary so whatever computer you're working on is going to have a slightly different uh, cache layout, not to mention other differences, like you, you don't know which core you might end up running on or which set of cores and all kinds of things. Um, um, so that's a big general problem in scientific computing and high performance computing. Um, I got a question. Um, are we using the information in Appendix 4A for the quizzes and tests? Um, or is it just a kind of a need to you know, want to know kind of information extra? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, no, I don't think so. There's some, some more information about the simulations in there, I guess. But, um, but yeah, not really. Not for the quizzes anyway. Okay. So. When you're doing your programming and you, you're having those cache issues, is this can you directly use a simulator like that to figure out those issues, or it's just theoretical that you are kind of guessing at it? Um, yeah, I probably wouldn't use a simulator, but you know, sometimes you really do have to go down and look. Okay, well, how big actually is my L1 cache, and does that mean that I need to limit? my loops or change my loops in some way to ensure that they stay within that size so that I, I do all the work I can on one cache page once it's loaded before I try to move to a different portion of my array to work on that so that it, it minimizes the, the the misses that go on. You know? So that's the kind of tuning that you usually end up doing that, that ends up specific to your kind of cache hierarchy for whatever your chips are. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So I think I'll go ahead and uh, stop for night. So everybody have a good night. Don't forget the test four. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Thank you. Good Thank night. you, sir. Have a good night. Sure. Thanks.